uh, the topic today concerns what you might say is the, the platform for morality. So I want to start, uh, let's see now, I, my, my, okay, this, my slides, oh, here we go, there now, okay. Um, I want to start actually with a comment by Ed Wilson the great biologist um, in 1975. And he said, the evolution of human sociality is the fundamental conundrum of biology. And I think that this was motivated by several things. And one was that the acknowledgement that we all understand very well that the deepest level of value in biological organisms has to do with one's own survival and well-being. You might call that uh, one's life value. Um, so that's very fundamental. It, were it not so, then of course, uh, that particular species who doesn't care about its own survival uh, would not last. It was also, I think, related to an extension of that idea by Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene, who said, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. And so this made it seem as though moral behavior was really exceptional, unusual, and seen only in humans, that only humans have this capacity and it depends on the capacity to reason and to learn. Now, it's interesting to me that Although Dawkins was uh, greatly influenced by Darwin, Darwin took a very different view. Darwin said that our moral sense or conscience depends on three things. And this was in his book, The Descent of Man, published 1871. He said it depends on social instincts. So he didn't think that that was essentially learned. Some things were learned, like habits and skills and how to behave within the group. He also thought there was an important role for problem solving as the ecology changed in one way or another. This was also the view of Aristotle, Confucius, and uh, the two great Scots, David Hume uh, and Adam Smith. And so it ran very much against the idea that uh, there is uh, an essentially distinct thing that humans and no other animals do, and that we do not have instincts for sociality. Now, in the last 20 to 25 years, I think ethologists and evolutionary biologists have recorded so much data regarding social mammals and social birds that it's now very difficult to say that only humans are genuinely social. Um, and the kind of behavior we see is involves, as in, in this uh, photograph, consolation. There's also reconciliation after a dispute, pro-social choice, that is to say, sacrifice for oneself or others. We see orphan adoption. And this is seen, for example, in marmosets, but it's also seen in chimpanzees. Chris Besh has seen five distinct examples of male chimpanzees who adopted um, babies whose mothers were killed or died and to whom they were not biologically related. I think that's quite extraordinary because caring for a child and rearing it uh, is, is a big job. We also see self-control, cooperation, and reasoning in a social context. So the old idea that we humans are absolutely unique uh, with respect to sociality seems incorrect. Now, of course, evolutionary biologists have long known that we see social insects and social fish, for example, in addition to social mammals. But the behavior of fish and insects and social, uh, for example, snakes even, um, the, the behavior is really quite different from what we see in mammals and birds in the sense that it is much less flexible, much less 
uh, sensitive to changes in the environment. And as you might say, it's rather more reflexively driven. So the question still remains, why do we see, what's the evolutionary story about why we see this kind of sociality in mammals and birds? And many of the details, of course, we don't understand, but the basic thread seems to be this that at some point about 250 million years ago, endotherms, that is warm-blooded animals, appeared on the face of the planet. And this was really an extraordinary advantage because it meant that they could hunt at night when um, the lizards and so forth had to wait for the sun to come up for their energy. It also meant that they could live in colder climates. Now, with the upside, of course, comes a downside. And the downside is that gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much. You can go away for a week and leave your lizards behind. You can't go away for a week and leave your cat behind. They have to eat. And so this is a huge ecological constraint. So how did Mother Nature address that constraint? And the answer basically, you could have done various things. Mother Nature could have over many gazillions of years uh, enhanced the capacity to be smart, but the easiest thing to do was to enhance the capacity to learn. And if you had, I mean, that's just, I'm anthropomorphizing obviously, but Mother Nature says to herself, well, we, we got to get these guys more food, these endotherms, uh, let's create a structure whereby once they're born, they can learn enormously and they can use that learning along with the old structures, the ancient structures that lizards have to survive. And that essentially was strategy. But notice that there was a huge cost. As the learning capacity postnatally goes way up, the independence of the newborns goes way down. Whereas a turtle can come out of its egg, does not need help from its mom, scrambles to the water and does its best, a baby chimpanzee is utterly helpless when it's born. So that means then that there is another adjustment that has to be made. Now, what makes us such incredible learners, mammals and birds, is this thing, cortex. And you can see um, on the outline of this section of uh, human brain, this purple structure on the outside is the cortex. And the older structures that we share essentially with pre-mammalian animals are, uh, are below. And cortex, at least in mammals, it looks a little different in birds, but cortex in mammals is highly structured into very specific layers and uh, with very specific cell types and very specific connections. But the other thing that's really quite magical about cortex is that when a bird or a mammal is born, its cortex looks something like this. There are cells, but they are not fully elaborated. There are few synapses, few dendritic arborizations, few branches. By one month, you see a huge increase. Nine months, we, we see a vast increase. And this is owed to the animal learning about its environment. And in particular, it turns out, learning about its social environment. Pierre Changeau uh, has calculated that there are about 10 million synapses per second created in the human brain of a neonate. So this means then that the, the strategy of using learning about the environment in order to get smart, in order to feed yourself, uh, basically works. And here we have neonate rats. Most of you will not have seen neonate rats perhaps, but it's important to see that when rats are born, 
they are hairless, they cannot see, they are entirely dependent. And of course, it doesn't take them very many days um, before they are scurrying about. So what we see in mammals and birds is the expansion of the domain where the brain manages, self, uh, manages well-being. Initially, in the pre-mammalian organisms, uh, the deep value was all about me. And now, because of the development of cortex and the need to learn, we see it involves me and mine. And I, I, I just want to mention some of the great scientists who have contributed um, to this conception. So part of what we want to know are the details of how exactly it, this is done. And um, although the story ends up being, to the degree that we understand it now, it ends up being very complex. The basic sort of outline of the story is actually rather simple. All vertebrates have oxytocin and vasopressin. These are neural hormones. And in pre-mammals, they are largely concerned with stress. Vasopressin responds in fearful and, and um, difficult situations. Oxytocin is uh, lowers stresses. Now in mammals, both of these were put to new jobs. And it turns out uh, that one of the jobs has to do with, this isn't going too well, has to do with forming an attachment between parents and offspring, and in particular between mother and offspring. So as the mother gives birth, there is this rush of oxytocin in her brain. And as she cuddles and, and um, nurses the baby, there is oxytocin released in the baby's brain. And over time, this attachment, this feeling of me and mine becomes extremely strong. And we can see this in rats, in wolves, in humans, in chimpanzees and so forth. So, so what's the story then about oxytocin and vasopressin? And I'm going to make all kinds of simplifications for which I apologize in advance, um, but this is just a one hour talk. So, so um, on the left-hand side, what you can see is the location of the hypothalamus, which is a subcortical structure, very ancient. And what we see in, in the hypothalamus are projections to other areas, to the nucleus accumbens. So when there is a projection there, there are neurons that respond to it, and the result is feeling of pleasure. And that's extremely important um, because pleasure and pain turn out to be the critical sort of dynamical properties that uh, allow us to develop these very strong attachments. Um, and if you take a slightly closer look at the uh, hypothalamus, we see that um, there are really two regions that release oxytocin and vasopressin. One is here, the paravent paraventricular and the supraoptic, but notice that they also release into the pituitary. So oxytocin is found all over the body as well as all over the brain. It's found in the ovaries, in the testes, in the gut, in the lungs. And it's because it's so ancient, I suppose, it has come to serve um, many different purposes. So I want now to connect this, not just to parent-infant bonding, which uh, is, is kind of the basic story, but how you can get an extension of behavior from parent-infant bonding to bonding to others in your group. Now, what you're looking at here is a montane vole, a mountain vole, and he's a little furry guy, and he's basically, or she is basically a loner. They, male and female will meet, they mate and then they go their separate ways. 
Now, prairie voles, which you see here, are very different. It turns out that prairie voles meet, they mate, and then they stay together for life. They may have a little action on the side, but basically they are mated for life. The male shown here huddling over the pups takes as much care of the pups as the female. So when the female scuttles off to get food, the male stays and takes care of the babies. He defends the nest against intruders, including other females who might be interested in him. Now the story here is all about oxytocin. And so let's have a slightly closer look at the differences in the brain of the nucleus accumbens in the montane vole and the prairie vole. So montane voles are not, do not have long-term bonding, but prairie voles do. Now, what you're looking at on the top row are slices of brain from montane vole on the left and prairie vole on the right. And down here is the nucleus accumbens, which is a critical part of the reward system. And over here, you also see the nucleus accumbens. Now, what is important in this slide is that cells that have oxytocin receptors, that is structures to which the oxytocin binds, are stained. And you can see that in the prairie vole, there's a very high density of receptors for oxytocin, whereas in the montane vole, not much. Vasopressin, we are going to talk about a, a little later, but uh, you see different structures in the prairie vole and the montane vole showing density of receptors uh, for vasopressin. So the question then is, is this just a correlation or, or uh, is, is this really part of the causal story for the particular um, bonding behavior that we see in, in prairie voles? And so various neuroscientists, many from uh, Larry Young's lab and Emory, um, would block receptors in the prairie vole and see what happens and and genetically introduce oxytocin receptors in mice and see whether you get long-term bonding. And the short story is, it looks like there is a significant causal role that this is not mere correlation. Now, um, prairie voles are uh, long-term pair bonders, but there are about 5% of all mammals are long-term pair bonders. Um, about 95% of birds are long-term pair bonders. So when you see those eagles out the window or uh, turkey vultures, for example, they are long-term pair bonders. And here are our marmosets, intensely social South American uh, mammals. And they are long-term pair bonders, but not only that, the male takes, um, a tremendously important role in the rearing of the infants. And here too, the males have um, been willing to care for infants that are not their own, to adopt them, to carry them about, to make sure they're fed um, and so forth. Interestingly enough, beavers are, are uh, long-term pair bonders as are wolves. So in highly social mammals, um, we see then that there is not only this deep mammalian connection between parents and offspring, but also in some cases between parents, uh, between individuals and mates. But in other cases, it may not be so much individuals and mates, but individuals and kin the mom and the daughters and her daughters and her daughters, as in the case of baboons, for example. Um, there can also, of course, depending on how you modify this platform, there can be very strong connections with unrelated friends in your community. But the main point is that when there is attachment, when there is bonding, then there is the motivation to help when, uh, when needed. Um, just to say then a little bit more about uh, the hypothalamus, this is a sketch of 
the uh, uh, <clears throat> the rodent brain, and what you see is the the paraventricular nucleus and the supraoptic nucleus of the thalamus. And here again, what you want to see is that they project to uh, the reward structures and to the ventral tegmental area, which is absolutely critical in releasing dopamine to bring about reward learning. Notice too that there is a, a connection in rodents to the olfactory bulb. And what we end up seeing, if you can document where the oxytocin receptors are, so they're gonna be shown by this little kind of funny why thing. You see that there are receptors for oxytocin in many, many areas of the brain. And this appears to be true of humans as well. So it's not just the reward system, but uh, almost certainly parts of cortex that are very sensitive, for example, to social perceptions. So, um, Behaviorally, what do we see then, just to sort of sum up, uh, with the release of oxytocin, we see the autonomic arousal decreases. In other words, um, if an animal is stressed but oxytocin is released, cortisol goes down and oxytocin goes up. So it is inversely connected. It's a stress releaser. Um, and it decreases defensive postures. And this is really interesting because as you're going to see, vasopressin can increase defensive postures. And sometimes when an animal is both um, taking care of its uh, offspring, its baby and loving it, but at the same time recognizing that a predator is about, you can have release of both oxytocin and vasopressin, and that combination is very, is, is not really well understood for how exactly that affects behavior and for an interesting reason. Okay. Um, it's interesting uh, as people have examined a little bit more what exactly happens in the brain under various social uh, interactions such as food sharing, it turns out that oxytocin levels uh, actually go up. And then the animals are also apt to groom each other, which again, lowers stress and raises the level of oxytocin. Now I mentioned that oxytocin and vasopressin can sometimes interact in very complicated ways. And this is a slide from Sue Carter, who's one of the great endocrinologists of our time. And what she wants to show in this is that you can have oxytocin bind to oxytocin receptors. In, in cases where everything is really very, uh, very well, um, the animal is, is not in any way threatened, it's not afraid, it's not anxious. Or you can have vasopressin attaching to vasopressin receptors. And that can be when perhaps somebody in the group is aggressive and you have to be defensive, when you have to freeze, um, or when you have to avoid somebody. Now, in between, we can see that there are many situations where oxytocin is released and binds vasopressin is released and binds. And so you have both a kind of advance and yet a kind of wariness. And in Sue's review in 2018, she suggests that this happens often in bonding behavior or in sexual behavior, especially in the early stages of sexual behavior. And it can happen with parental behavior when there is a threat, when there is some form of anxiety. And probably much of our lives involves this. We're lucky if occasionally everything is so nice that, you know, the oxytocin flows and we just feel great. But mostly, much of our lives are like that. And here's the interesting thing, which I'll get to shortly. As a result of epigenetic considerations, 
individual variation and individual differences in how this works out are going to obtain. So we'll look at that in a, in a minute. But here's, here's just an example where the wolves are surrounding the moose. You can see the wolves here. They know exactly what one another is doing. The moose mother is got a flood of vasopressin because she knows she's got to defend this animal, but she's also got a lot of oxytocin because she loves this baby. Meanwhile, of course, uh, the wolves are uh, paying attention to each other. They are tightly bonded to each other. Will the, will the wolves succeed? Almost certainly they're in for a very big meal of mother and baby. So, so what, how might experiences change such things as oxytocin levels or density of receptors for oxytocin and for vasopressin? Alison Perkybile has, has done some really beautiful work woo showing um, in, in rodents uh, that there can be really significant differences. And this is just a very simple slide, but I think it's tremendously important. So these are, um, I think these were mice actually. And what she did was she had a whole lot of newborn mice. Some got the normal parental care, some she removed for a few hours a day and they were kept warm and fed, but they weren't during that period with their mom, they weren't being licked and cuddled and so forth. So what did we see? Well, there was an increase in oxytocin receptor DNA methylation. In other words, uh, the, the DNA that expresses the gene for uh, oxytocin receptors is decreased in activity. So you see decreased oxytocin receptor expression. So that means you've got fewer oxytocin receptors. And that means you've got less oxytocin binding because you don't have all those receptors. So is the effect long lasting? It appears to be. And what happens to the social behavior? And the answer was quite interesting. Now, bear in mind, these are mice. Um, but what she saw was that in the mice that uh, had the experimental manipulation, as mothers, they had decreased species typical social behavior. In particular, they were not good mothers. They didn't stay with their babies, cuddle their babies, lick their babies, and so forth, to the same degree um, that the control mice did. So this is an, an, a very interesting start. Um, and other people are now also looking at the effects of early experiences where all that synaptic growth is taking place in cortex and affecting the, the control of emotions and the release of emotions and so on, how early experience affects density of receptors for oxytocin uh, in the brain. Now, I want to turn just uh, for a little bit um, to talk about norms um, because uh, a really important part of learning behavior for all mammals and all birds um, is to acquire the norms, what's acceptable in this group, what's okay, what isn't okay. And again, um, the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens, this critical components of the reward system are the key structures. And so experience has a profound effect on, on sociality and also on how to behave, how to get along, what isn't acceptable, um, and so forth. Now, this seems to me important because I think it addresses to some degree those philosophers who have long thought that norms come out of pure reason and that only some of us, themselves of course, uh, only some of us are really able to figure out what the norms should be. And it also, I think, reflects badly on the idea that whatever norms there are, 
must be universal. Whatever is right must be right, not just for this group, but for all groups and for all times. And that amazingly enough, uh, American philosophers in the 20th century seem to have figured out what those are. All right, sorry, that was slightly sarcastic, didn't really mean it. But the story about norms is really complex. And that's because as Aristotle completely understood, as did Confucius, norms conflict with preferences. They also conflict with other norms. You can't, despite what Kant said, you can't have a rule that says you must always tell the truth because it will conflict with certain other norms about not murdering people or what have you. Norms also vary across individuals or across groups. Um, and they vary within an individual across time. And somehow in ways that neuroscience really does not yet understand, relevant memories play into what norm is perceived by an individual in a situation to motivate behavior. And sometimes the, right, the, the answer, this norm just comes. Sometimes people reflect on it. Um, and often though, if circumstances require a very speedy response, you don't have time to do something like uh, a utilitarian calculation. And this just makes the more general point that if animals trust and like each other, cooperation can, can emerge. And I, I, I am very fond of what we know about the Inuit in, in, in the Arctic because they really did live in such a hostile environment and they had norms that pertain to conflict resolution, for example, that really worked very well for them and probably don't work uh, quite so well for us. I mean, one conflict resolution issue, I mean, this might work in the United States Senate, but I rather doubt it, was who can tell the funniest story? Uh, and um, all right. So the other point I want to make here too is that Although I've talked a lot about the fact that the reward system, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area are involved, um, some work has now been done on whether or not in a context where you make an altruistic choice that affects your perception of pain. And in this particular example, um, what was done was, was this. Um, at the beginning of the experiment, individuals could either, uh, oh, actually, no, individuals were assigned to two different groups. In one group, they were just paid for uh, uh, participating in the experiment. In the other group, they were paid, but then they were given the opportunity, which they all took, to donate their money to children who were victims of an earthquake. So you administer pain by using a tight tourniquet. And what you see is, is this, that it's over three minutes that the tourniquet is on. And of course the pain gets greater and greater as you know. And the difference between the groups is really quite substantial. Now this is in self-reporting how much pain you're feeling using a standardized scale. But those who took the altruistic choice are shown in blue, and by and large, they felt less pain in, uh, in this situation. There are other examples where, uh, done by the same lab actually, where um, in a painful situation where you can either be altruistic or not, uh, and they scanned the brains of the individuals during, during the experiment, and again, they got results indicating that the brain too shows what you would expect to give these data, that there is less activity in pain sensitive areas for those who are altruistic. Okay, uh, oh yes, this is Yulu Wong and PNAS 2020. 
Um, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. Um, we all, of course, uh, knew of people, maybe ourselves, who felt very, very isolated during um, the, COVID, the, the height of the, of the COVID pandemic. Um, and people did feel an increase in anxiety, depression, and so forth. And when oxytocin levels were measured, <coughs> they were found um, to be lowered. So you might well ask, well, what could you do um, to raise oxytocin levels? Excuse me, I'm just going to take something for my throat. I think I've got a little bit of a tickle, a bit of a fall allergy here. Um, physical exercise, interestingly, raises levels of oxytocin, as do social interactions and social touch. <coughs> so let's try to give a sort of summary conception here of the link to morality of this story about oxytocin and vasopressin, the reward system, stress, and so on. And the first point is that sociality of the, in an evolutionary context begets other caring. It's one way of handling the fact that endotherms have to um, eat so much more. Other caring together with social learning, that is learning about how to get on in the group, beget social norms for what's right and what's wrong. And probably given that humans are in many, many respects very similar to one another in what we value, in, in what we fundamentally value, there are going to be similarities in norms across cultures. And then finally, problem solving in an ecology begets norm changes. We can see that certain norms might have to change when the ecology, for example, there's a new technology or there's a climate change or there's um, um, uh, some sort of predator or pest that invades the area, then there may have to be norm changes. So the hypothesis is that mammalian and avian sociability have a platform of oxytocin and those things that go into the reward system, the cannabinoids and the opioids. And that norms emerge from problem solving and are learned by a reward system. So morality on this hypothesis is not a module. Um, and there's your Swiss army knife. Um, and Swiss army knife, as you know, was used as a metaphor for, uh, for cognitive functions um, uh, by Tubi and Cosmides famously. But clearly morality is not a module. It is not neatly separable from the emotions or motives, reasoning. It's not separable from temperament or energy levels, from moods, from age, and so forth. It's a very, very complex business. Um, and it varies a lot between individuals. Um, and the other point is, and this is, oops, this is kind of a, a, a reminder, I guess, of, of Richard Dawkins' idea that you have to kind of beat morality into, into animals and into kids in particular. Uh, and if you don't, otherwise, Mother Nature would not have, have selected for uh, humans to survive. But the fact is that if our basic needs are met, and if sociality is pleasurable, which of course it is, we engage in many behaviors which are largely unrelated to passing on our genes. And I think that's something that Dawkins probably recognizes now, but it's certainly something that Darwin recognized, which I think is really quite, quite wonderful. Now, I'm going to just finish up because I promised Manuel I'd say something about concepts. Um, and, and what I have not done in this talk is given you a precise definition of morality. <clears throat> 
And that's really because like Eleanor Roche, I think that by and large with some scientific concepts as an exception, by and large, our concepts and our categories have a radial structure with prototypes at the center, fuzzy boundaries, and declining similarity to the prototypes as you approach the boundaries. And so, um, for example, the famous example is that vegetables, that you cannot precisely define a vegetable. Even if you go into a supermarket thinking, if any place has got a definition of a vegetable, it should be the market. <clears throat> Carrots are the prototype vegetable. Radishes, well, you know, some people don't think radishes are really a vegetable. They're a garnish. Nobody really likes them. They're not really. And what about wild mushrooms? Well, I eat them. I harvest them. Are they vegetables? I don't actually care. They're on the fuzzy boundary. And I'm not going to sweat it to get a precise definition of vegetables. So either, oh my gosh, uh, the, the mushroom is in it or it's out of it. It really doesn't matter. And for the most part, for many kinds of, of um, categories, it doesn't matter whether the boundary is precisely defined. Now, sometimes in the law, it does. So sometimes, for example, we will have to know precisely what is meant by embezzlement. But even the terms that are used to define embezzlement in the law are themselves of this kind. So there is no, almost no place, even in the law, where all of the concepts used to, to uh, characterize say, uh, an offense like fraud or embezzlement or first degree murder or what have you, the concepts used to characterize that are themselves have a radial structure. And, and of course, the concept of house has a radial structure. And what's, what's kind of wonderful is that depending on your culture, uh, very different houses may be uh, at, the, at the center. And I think that that's a little bit like some aspects of what we count as moral. And that, um, so for example, the Inuit, if I may go back to them, um, have a very high standard for helping if, if someone is struggling with something. And, then, and that is because they consider it rather insulting in the way that I would be rather insulted if somebody offered to carry my groceries out of the car, uh, out of the, the supermarket into the car. I mean, they would look at my white hair and they think, oh, she's not really capable, I better give her a hand. I might feel rather insulted by that. And the Inuit are very sensitive to when their capacities are diminished. And so if you offered to help an Inuit do something, they might well be insulted by it. And although I might not be insulted by that particular kind of help in that situation. So I think what we can see is that uh, there are a lot of different ways of handling social, socially difficult situations and that when we become immersed in a culture that's different from one that we just left, we need to kind of be sensitive to and, and pick up uh, the, the norms of the locals. So I think that's true with all of these kinds of things, that there are prototypes of what it is to be a friend, to be honest, to be kind, brave, and trustworthy. Uh, and there are boundary cases. And sometimes we don't know what to say about the boundary cases. If the boundary case arises in the context of the law, we may be obliged to say something. Um, but that doesn't necessarily imply that the concept is well-defined. And I think the same is true of moral and not moral, that um, those are not well-defined. We understand and we pretty much agree on the prototypical cases 
And we certainly find that we disagree on boundary cases. And there may be more or less agreement uh, in between. And I think with that, um, yeah, I'll just finish. I think with that, uh, I just want to sort of wrap up because we've been almost 60 minutes here. Um, but maybe with a just sort of quick thought, and that is that I've been rather troubled, I guess, all my, all my philosophical life by the idea that there are really only two approaches to, um, to moral standards that we need to take seriously. One is Kant's and absolute moral rules, and the other is utilitarianism, and there really isn't anything else. And my sense, you know, from reading Aristotle was there's a lot else. And not only is there a lot else, but by and large, it's most else. It's not either absolute rules that apply in an exceptionalist way, a la Kant, or um, utilitarianism. It doesn't mean the consequences don't matter. Of course they do, but is it the case that uh, we have, we are always obliged to do the utilitarian calculation and help the greatest number have the greatest happiness and the smaller number who may turn out to be our kids, don't matter. I find that tough. It makes no sense to me. And biologically, I think it's kind of off the charts. So anyway, with that, thank you for your attention and for your time. <laughs>